Petty and Tony Reed. This morning, when my wife got back home from her usual Friday morning trip, so when I walked in this place tonight, I saw my wife, I came over to the side, I said, well, I just saw your country cousin. And she says, which one is it? And I said, it's Jimmy Dean. Would you stand up, Jimmy? <laughs> This time I'm going to call on Henry Holman, as chairman of our board, head of our organization, to come and say a few words to you. Thank you, Al. On behalf of Jitney Jungle, it's a pleasure to welcome each of you to our Manufacturers Appreciation Dinner. We'd like to say thank you to all your suppliers who have made this event possible. We're real appreciative of our employees, hundreds of them who work many, many hours, but one particular person who has worked for over six months has been our chairman and our coordination, and that's Al Booth. Now, I'd like to ask Al, please stand where we are. Give him a hand. I had the opportunity to play with one of our celebrities in golf this afternoon. I was horrified to get a phone call yesterday saying he cannot play. The weather's going to be too bad in Jackson today. It's impossible for him to play golf on such a day. Uh, speaking, of course, to the Honorable Jimmy Dean on my right, I arrived at the airport uh, to meet him, and uh, he said, no, but really, that wasn't the problem, you know, that it wasn't the weather. It says, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm just too poor a fellow, you know, to, to cover any bets in golf. I want to let you tell you about Jimmy Dean. I had the privilege of attending the annual stockholders meeting of Sara Lee Corporation three weeks ago. They had a packed house. They served free food and all the ladies showed up. <laughs> Asked a million questions. And I saw a fellow that came into this meeting with this cowboy hat and boots. And I saw it was Jimmy Dean. So I asked this little lady to my left, I says, who is that fellow over there? And with authority, she spoke out, he's one of the largest stockholders of Sarah Lee. He is Jimmy Dean. <laughs> so I feel sorry for you, poor little Jimmy Dean. <laughs> you certainly should, bless your heart. <laughs> Take up a collection right now. <laughs> well, I wasn't able to play golf, so I guess I just had to sort of talk about it. Uh, I used to play with one of the leading there's a lot of things I can't do and I just talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we get through this, we're going to give him a microphone, he might even sing. <laughs> it's another one of our outstanding people of promise here. I used to play golf with him. Fella that uh, name is George Bryan. Back then, we don't ever play anymore, but I did play the last time with him at the Grocery Manufacturers Meeting of America in White Sulphur Springs, Greenbrier. And on that particular occasion, uh, we played. George started off just a beautiful backswing on the practice team when he got on the green. Really got out of playing. He just was so fast, he missed almost every shot. But he came home then evening went to the room and Marsh was there and he was griping and moaning and all about the golf you know and about not going to play with me anymore and, and he's got the moment said what's wrong says and so George said to Marshall well what would you do if the fellow you were playing with uh teed up in the rough he kicked his ball out from behind the tree he just downright cheated she said, well, I wouldn't play with a fellow like that. He said, that's the very reason Henry Holt won't play with me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> We're really excited about uh, the event tonight. It's really, it's really exciting to us. We expect over 10,000 people at our event for the next two days. And we have a great show that we are very indebted to that we think will be exciting. We've had this show for several years. We've been fortunate enough to win the top award, but we've never had it consumer-oriented like it is this particular year. 
and we feel sure the people of Central Mississippi are really excited about it. I'd like to remind you and tell you that some of the activities that we have planned is, of course, we have, thanks to you, over several hundred thousand dollars worth of value coupon. We have the Stars of the Soaps, which is, which is Stars from Another World. We have Grant Kramer, Michael Damon, from Stars from the Young and Restless. We have magicians. We have Molly from McCray's. We have the Ole Miss Molly Squad from the University of Mississippi. We have all kinds of different characters. We think it's going to be one of the most exciting things ever put on in the food arena down in Mississippi State Fairground. So we're just really excited and appreciative of all the wonderful things that you made possible for us. At this time, it just gives me a great pleasure to introduce Jackson's outstanding mayor. We have one of the more outstanding mayors in the United States, and he is with us here tonight. He has served his third term and was recently elected to this position. Dale has been very effective in an architecture of a modern city. He's redone the police department of precincts. He has been very active in flood control to this part of Mississippi. And please give a round of hand to Mayor Dale Dyson. Thank you very much, Henry, and I appreciate the fact that you have not described any of your golf games with me. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to welcome such an outstanding group of individuals to the city of Jackson, Mississippi, and we certainly want you to feel welcome in our city. You know, it, this is an exciting weekend in Jackson, in case you haven't noticed, with all the activities that are taking place, and I know that tomorrow and Sunday's activities as it relates to the food festival is, is going to be one of the highlights. But we certainly appreciate your being here. Jackson, Mississippi is a fast-growing metropolitan area. And one reason that it is is because of people such as Bill McCarty and Henry Holman. And McCarty Holman, which we consider to be a homegrown industry, an industry that has started right here in Jackson, Mississippi, has stayed in Jackson, Mississippi, and has done business with people throughout the international arena insofar as their particular profession is concerned, which has brought to Jackson, Mississippi, a great deal of pride and a great deal of recognition. So tonight, I particularly am proud to be here and share this occasion because of what Bacardi Holman has meant to this community and to this state and to what so many of you vendors who do business with Bacardi Holman have meant to this state and its productivity. So let's have a good time tonight. And let me say one thing, and this is for tonight only, doesn't mean a thing to Jacksonians, only to our visitors, because we've got a number of very special guests from across the country here tonight. As I said, this is an exciting weekend, a lot of things going on, and I got some nervous policemen out there tonight. <laughs> and if you should get that little piece of paper that's called citation, you just turn on the back of it and write, I love Jackson, and send it to us, and you'll be okay. Okay? God bless you. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you were going to tell a joke, 
Thank you, Al. Henry told me that God joke. And since he did, I'm going to tell you something that's a true story. It happened right down in this uh, jitney down number, jitney number 50 on the old Canton Road uh, last Friday night. This blind man uh, came into the store with his C&I dog. And he uh, walked around the store a little bit. The dog led him, you know. And in a minute, he picked the dog up by the tail. He started slinging this dog around over his head. And the dog started to yell. And he got hard. The manager came over and said, Sir, why are you uh, twirling that dog around by the tail? He says, I'm just looking around. <laughs> I want to tell you on behalf of our 73 year old company and our 4,300 faithful employees working in 52 supermarkets and three distribution facilities, we say thanks to the nearly 200 manufacturers and their representatives who are sponsoring and manning the booze at the trademark during the next two days. We also want to say thank, thanks to our mayor, his wife, our guests, and to the Jenny Jungle, Sack and Save, McCarty Holman team who diligently worked and, and performed and put on this holiday food festival this year. This is the start of something new for our company and for our state. This will be an annual event. Plans have already been laid for next year's Holiday Food Festival. And we hope that those suppliers, brokers, and manufacturers and their representatives who are with us now will find it to their advantage to participate again next year. All of us are anticipating a large turnout of our customers, friends, during the up to coming days. We all look forward to seeing you there. I now ask Al Benton to introduce our guest speaker. Al Benton. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, y'all are. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad for you to see me, I guarantee. If you eat what I cook, you'd look a hell of a lot better than you do now. <laughs> guarantee. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure for me to be in Jackson this evening to talk to you and tell you some Cajun stories. If I think there's something serial to talk to you about that, I haven't thought of it yet. But no matter where I go in this great country of ours, I always like to explain briefly just what a Cajun is. I don't want anybody to leave the ignorance tonight. The word Cajun is spelled C-A-J-U-N, pronounced Cahoon in Mexico. <laughs> it's a mutilation of the word Acadian, not Acadian, not mutilated, no, just the word. And the word Acadian comes from those tremendously hardy people who left France and came to the New World to chase after what everybody else likes to run after. <laughs> the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> and they came to the New World and chased hell out of it, I want you to know. <laughs> now they aimed with the southern portion of North America with an ill wind and very poor navigation and landed them in Nova Scotia. And they settled in a small area in Nova Scotia called in French, Acadie in English, that's Acadia. And they were happy there until 230 years ago, last August. <laughs> <laughs> when England took over all of Nova Scotia, including Acadie or Acadia back there in those days, some of England was subject to doing that, that before she became a welfare state. And the English told all these French-speaking people who spoke nothing but French and hell, they came from France, that was more or less normal. And look, you got this way allegiance to the king of England. They wouldn't do that. But boy, would they swear at him. <laughs> and good. 
I told him you got to leave here, and they wouldn't do that too. So they ran them down and caught them. That is most of them. They missed a few, but they caught most of them. And they let them carry what they could in their two hands and arms. And they put them on small sailing vessels or boats or ships, whatever you want to call them. And they started down the Atlantic Sea coast trying to get to Louisiana. But some of them had some friends and relatives, and they knew some other people down there. Now, history has it, this is true. I had to call a reporter on the Boston Globe and correct that ignoramus. <laughs> history has it, they tried to land in New England, and those good church going people wouldn't let them. And boy, am I glad. <laughs> I'd hate like hell to be a cave day in a little town called French Seven. And they were happy there for the scout. They didn't want to be picked up and sunk somewhere else some more. Now in French, you pronounce the word Acadian, Carillon, or Carillon, depending on what kind of a Carillon, Carillon you may be. In South Louisiana, Carillon, Carillon being too sudden, they just showed that the Cajon, Cajun, and Cajun. In English, that's pronounced Cajun. <laughs> Now, us Cajun, you know, some of you people got some other names for us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all right with us, because we got some other names for you, too. <laughs> you know, I'm half Louisiana Cajun. I'm very proud of that fact. I think it's a damn poor dog who won't wag his own tail. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I was full of belief, but I know it's a good thing I'm not. I couldn't have stood a full dose of this. <laughs> they would have killed me dead. <laughs> By profession, Al, I happen to be a professional member of the American Society of Safety Engineers. I'm a safety man. I wear both belt and suspenders. I don't take chances. <laughs> and a few years back, I was in Chicago. We went to a big boarding house called the Conrad Hilton for a big safety meeting. How you call it? They call it a safety congress. I walked in this big, big hotel and looked in there. There's a, a desk and behind there's a clock. I walked up, he said, what can I do for you? I, I said, not a damn thing, man. I got a reserve here. <laughs> he said, what's your name? I said, front name or behind name? <laughs> he said, fourth name. And I told him in good English, Justin Wilson. <laughs> you know you don't understand that? <laughs> he said, how do you spell that? And I'm so glad he asked because I just learned how. <laughs> and I spell it for him. He said, let me look on the book. Can I, can I, can I? He said, I don't see you. They might look, man. Let's start this over. Slow yourself down. Ain't nobody can look that fast. <laughs> he turned one page. I said, that's my name right there. He said, that's right, but you got to put your name on the register. I said, put him out, chill. He put a little card out there, and I'm printing my name real careful, because some people can read reading, but they can't read writing. You know I mean? <laughs> Just when I got through, the biggest damn bed book <laughs> walked right across my name. I back up four or three steps, and I looked that clock right on the eye with both eyes, and I told him, I've been bit by the flea in Jackson, Mississippi, <laughs> bled by the spider in Shreveport, Louisiana, and chased by the policemen in New Orleans. But that's the very first time I ever had a bed bug look up my room number in my life. I'll <laughs> you. Now, I went and got on the elevator. That's a bunch of trade fishing. And he got his boat rigged up to with a mirror reflectorizing on the water in Lake Pontchartrain. And the commercial fisherman would go by him and look. He's out there about 10 days, and finally one of them been out there every day fishing commercially. They got catch too, they got to ask him, what the hell are you doing with that mirror out there? So he pulled up and he cut his motor, chunk out his anchor. He said, Father, what the hell are you doing with that mirror? Huh? He said, I'm catching fish. And he pointed to a bunch of fish he got in the bottom of the boat. He said, the hell you are? He said, you see them fish, huh? Oh, he said, yeah. He said, well, how in the world does it work? He said, I can't tell you that, man. That'll cost you money to learn that. I ain't about to tell you that. How much money are you talking about? I'll be glad to find it. I'm a commercial man. I would like to go. He said, cost you $100. He has his two fifty dollars bill. Told me about that thing right now. How many fish have you caught with that mirror? He said, you're the 12th one. I guarantee <laughs> fishing stories. I, I got a friend that down there in that meat river near where Jeanine and I live. He, every time he gets back to the boat launching place, he's got a boat load of fish there in Port Vicar, but a lot of restaurant. All kind of fish. Sometimes he nearly sink in the boat, he got some in. Gar, <laughs> buffalo, <laughs> German carp, 
Fish, eel, shoe pig. Y'all call them grill, not knowing no better. All kind of catfish, big mouth basses, a little mouth basses, suckerle. Y'all call them white birds, not knowing no better. Sometimes even a little alligator about four or three feet long. And one day the game warden with Dan says, Man, you caught some big. He said, You damn right. He said, I would like to go with you sometime. Be glad to have you, warden. When are you going some more? Tomorrow morning, three o'clock. I would like to go. Be here three o'clock. You can go. You ain't chill. You ain't go. He said, I'll be here. Next morning, three o'clock, you will die. And they get in that boat at Amity River, they start down it. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. At three o'clock in the morning on that meat river, when the moon goes down here, dark. Dark as the inside of a cow, that's how dark. <laughs> but they were guided by the tree line, and just at daylight, the little kid cut the motor and shook out the anchor, and the game warden did all the shows they had fun. Hey, did you do it? But you left all your fishing tackle bags to launch it, please. The little kid didn't say a word. Recently, they seen got a little brown box, one feet long, a half a feet deep. They opened it up, reading in, got a stick of dynamite, took a cap in that, a little short fuse. Crimp it down real good. <laughs> Puff on a cigar, put a little short fuse, chunk it out of that me real blue. Fish everywhere. <laughs> he picked them up with both hands, put them in the boat. Game warden sitting there catching flies. Take a while and said, hey, partner, don't you know that's illegal as hell? Don't you realize I'm the game warden? Well, you don't have to put you on the jail, huh? The kid didn't say a word. He said, he just got the little brown box some more. Pulled it up. He then got another stick of dynamite. Took another cap in that. Another short fuse. Crimp it down real good. Put on a cigar. Put a little short fuse. Stuff that stick of dynamite in the game one hand. And hey, look, you're going to talk a fish. <laughs> <laughs> and his barroom saloon had a big high bar and a, and a stool was so high that an eight-foot basketball player's feet wouldn't touch the ground if he sat there. And I walked in there one day and a couple of my friends were sitting on his high stool and they had just about a, oh, half a dozen too many, not one too many. One of them said, she stand. That's my front name and friend. I said, what can I do for you, my friend? He said, can you give us a favor, huh? I'll be glad to give you a favor. What you want me to do? He said, we're up or down from this stool with two drunk, we're going to fall we're trying to get down. <laughs> I said, I'll be glad. So they held down the stool. They got on that floor on their hands and knees and walked right out that trail. <laughs> walked right across Highway 90, the old Spaniel Trail. Get up on the Southern Pacific Railroad. And after a while, one of them said, you know something? This is the longest set of stairway steps I never climbed before. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, I don't mind it. Long stairway step, but this low handrail is giving me hell. <laughs> I know that everybody in this room thinks that George Washington was born in Virginia. That ain't true, no. George was born in Gaydon, Louisiana. Right outside of Gaydon on a farm, a rice farm. <coughs> Now, George, down there in, in, in that area there, there ain't no trees unless somebody's climbing. It's reclaimed marshland. They raised a lot of rice down there. And George's father had a 1,500-acre field that he raised rice on. And there's one tree on that whole 1,500-acre, and that's a beautiful live oak tree that old man Washington plant himself. It's done got to be eight inch in diameter both ways. <laughs> And one day, old man Washington said, George, I got to go to town on business. Actually, he was going to play bourree. Cajun <laughs> <laughs> folk. Mm. He said, I want you to help your mama around the farm. He said, okay, Papa. He said, George, I don't believe you want to be a farmer. Oh, no, Papa, I don't want to be no farmer. What you want to be when you grow up, George? He said, I want to go into politics in Louisiana. <laughs> Then Papa said, well, I'll see you later. 
He went to come and got back late that afternoon just before dusk thawed. And somebody done cut down the only damn tree he got on the place, and he hollered real loud, Who cut that tree? Little George come out and said, What you said, Papa? <laughs> he said, I asked who cut that tree. George said, Papa, me, I cannot tell a lie. I'm not going to lie to you some, none at all, any, because I just can't dig it. Me, I cut that tree with my own little hatchet. What you said, boy? I say, I cannot tell a lie. I'm not going to lie some, none at all, any, because I cannot dig that. Me, I cut that tree down with my own little hatchet. George? Yeah, Papa. Go in the house and help your mama start packing right now. Where are we going, Papa? We're leaving you. We're going to Virginia. You told me you want to go into politics in Louisiana. That's right, Papa. You told me you cannot tell a lie. That's right, Papa. Well, you can't go into politics in Louisiana. We're going to Virginia. <laughs> He's a wine head, that's what he is. <laughs> he loved that old cheap wine. The cheaper the wine, the better he liked it. He can get more of it, you know what I mean. <laughs> Andy Greenspring, <laughs> T.J. Swan, Thunderbird, <laughs> Morgan David, <laughs> Boone Farm, Strawberry Hill, <laughs> Ripple. <laughs> he drinks my little cheap wine every day when he gets himself up the next morning. Boy, he takes the first little bit of sip. Ooh, he smells terrible. <laughs> then when he takes a few sips, it's possible he smells even worse. <laughs> and one Saturday morning, he woke up with a hang around. Ooh. In fact, a little bit of d and mixed in there. He turns a bad wallpaper going with him. <laughs> There's a little man sitting on his belly stomach playing boo ray. <laughs> He talked with himself, Ooh, I feel bad. <laughs> and I've been bad. And I got did something about both of that, but ain't even talking about doing something about being bad. I did something about feeling this terrible. And I don't know what they did about that. I got to run that dog down and they bit me and bite him back. <laughs> so reached on the bed and got about a half to that old moon from Strawberry Hill. He had him himself and <laughs> he drank it back. His courage began to come back all the way plumb. The wall pit was settled back on the wall. The little men quit playing bourree <laughs> on his belly stomach, but they left their cards. <laughs> you shall feel much more better. Now God did something about being bad, and I've been bad. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to confession. He would have happened. The more he said it, the more better it sounds. I'm going to confession. He got to then start to shave himself, and he knew he'd cut his throat. <laughs> He found another fit that old boon from Strawberry Hill. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> Shave himself, bathed himself, put his best suit, blue serge, and he went to confession. <laughs> now, for the benefit of some of you people who don't know nothing about a single confessional in the Catholic Church, I'll tell you how they construct it. A single confession got a little room on one side where, legally speaking, the confessor are going down. And on the other side, he got another little room where also, too, legally speaking, the confessee going down. In between, they got a little wire mesh cover window you can't see through it. But you can hear it through it. Then Father got to get up close, close, close to that little window, because then people do not talk loud. <laughs> and Father's up close, close, and my friend going in, he say, Father, old sour wine boat knocked that little breeze out. <laughs> he got way over the corner here to him and say, Yes, my son. <laughs> he said, I done hauled off and sinned and bad. <laughs> son, have you killed anybody? <laughs> oh, no. Father, I ain't killed nobody. <laughs> okay, son, that's enough confession for this week. <laughs> okay, Paul. Well, he said the act of contrition ain't back out of there. He walked out of church, he beat a friend with him, brought himself in, and said, you going to confession? Hell yeah, I'm going to confession. You killed anybody? Hell no, I ain't killed nobody. Well, ain't no use going on all these years in murder cases today. <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, in 
830 in the waiting room waiting for their wives, who in another room waiting to deliver, and I don't mean groceries. <laughs> in a few minutes, the nurse came out and said, Mr. Malone, so hey, baby, what I got a boy or a girl, huh? Huh? Mr. Alonso, you got one of each, you got twins. What you say? <laughs> you got twins. Did you say twins? That's what I said. Did you read did, 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 did you really mean twins? What a minute, twins. Fine healthy girl, fine healthy boy. Twins. <laughs> well, it's only right and proper I should have twins. I'm the head scout for the Minnesota Twins baseball team in South Louisiana, I should have twins. He turned on mother two kids and gave each one of them two cigars and he left in a few minutes. The same nurse come up and said, Mr. Bourgeois. What I got, baby? <laughs> Mr. Bourgeois, you got more than one, two. Twins? She said, no, you got triples. You got three of a lady. I got a weak heart. Don't start no foolishness with me. <laughs> no foolishness. You got two fine, healthy girls and a fine, healthy boy. Did you, did, you, did you really say three of them? I said three. Triple, triple. You mean that? I mean that. Three, three. Well, it's only right and proper. I should have a tree. I'm the head sales engineer for the 3M company in South Louisiana. I should have a tree. <laughs> the times other came to give him three cigars, he was hitting the door. He said, where the hell you go? He said, I'm leaving you. I drive a truck for the seven up company. <laughs> one year and that's all we're gonna say about that. <laughs> I love to go see the games in person. I love to see action on the field. It's the best quarterback club I've ever seen. Up until just a few years ago when they had the playoff, and that's when high school football really gets interesting to me. When you had the playoff, first you win district, and you play another team and win district quarter final. Well Today, if at the end of that, that game, when you're going to go see who can go to the quarterfinal, the score happened to be tied up, tie, tie, you know, like zip, zip, or seven, seven, zip, zip. They go into sudden death, but just 10 years ago, 12 years ago, in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and Texas, I always kept up with them. They didn't do that. What they would do, if at the end of the game, they fixed to go to the, they go try to go to the playoff. It's the end of this game, see who can go to the quarterfinal. The score was up, tied up, tie, tie. They didn't go into a certain depth. What they would do is they would count the number first down. If the number of down was tied up, tie, tie, first down was tied up, tie, tie, they would count the number of penetrates each team made to the other team's territory over the 50 yard line. If the number of penetrates were tie, tie, they'd flip a coin, might just run out of play the damn thing. <laughs> 